Bom dia, pessoal. É, testando aqui o início né, do seminário. É, sempre acho bom que uma pessoa dê um ok, que o, o som tá bom. Onde vocês puder dar o um ok. Eu acho que está tudo certo, né? Então, é, hoje a palestra vai ser em inglês. É, a doutora Yumi Kim é uma professora dos Estados Unidos, da Johns Hopkins. Eu vou apresentar ela em inglês por respeito a ela, tá bom? E é sobre é, controle de divisão celular, utilizando o um modelo de C. elegans, que é um nematóide. Então, talvez vocês não conheçam o modelo, também é legal vocês fazerem perguntas sobre a metodologia, sobre esse modelo. Um, Dr. Yumi, we welcome you for the seminar. Here we are different graduate programs in biology, and the students have different backgrounds, and also some of the professors are participating. And we would like to welcome you for the seminar in Campinas. Uh, Yumi has been in Campinas before for a short trip. And she has done, she is originally from South Korea. Then she has done her PhD at UCSD in California and followed by a short postdoc and then one another postdoc at uh, UC, UC University of California, Berkeley. Um, her lab is relatively new. Maybe at the end of the talk, she can mention uh, how many students she has now, right? They were also hit by the pandemics there. And usually the young professors, they also define one main project that they follow up. And Dr. Yumi's main project is focused on molecular control of meiotic chromosome dynamics. She has extensively studied some of these proteins during her PhD and postdoc and is following as an independent professor. And she already has publications with her students. And if you are interested, I can send you links for publication later because her name is pretty common, right? And we want to make sure you can access her papers. And I will also post some of them on the, the classroom. Yumi has given many talks already and has also participated in training uh, undergraduate and graduate students. Yumi, you can get started. And you have about 40 minutes and then we will have questions. People can post questions during your talk, but then I will compile them and ask you at the end, okay? Okay. And people can write questions in Portuguese, and then I can help. Okay, sounds good. Okay. Just a second. We also have one very senior professor from Brazil who has studied and brought the model to the country. Yeah, I guess our winter is here too. <laughs> cool. Okay, will you share my slide? This slide shows smaller on my screen, but I assume it's okay. Yeah, just a second. Okay, should I get started? Okay, this looks good. Okay, bon dia everyone. I'm so happy to give my presentation in Campinas. Um, Kathleen and I went way back to grad school and I visited Brazil for her wedding. So I've been to Campinas, especially I remember the shopping center. <laughs> okay, so today I'll be talking about some of our research that we've been conducting in my own lab at Johns Hopkins. 
And I will be talking about how chromosomes move and segregate correctly in, in meiosis, which is a special cell division that makes sperm and egg. Okay, so we all know that cells in most cells in our body are diploid. It means that each chromosome com comes in uh, pairs. And here you are looking at a karyotype of human male. And you can see that human cells have 23 pairs of chromosomes. And each chromosome pair, they are called homologous chromosomes. And you can see that there is also sex chromosome X and Y. And chromosome comes in pairs because we inherit one set of chromosome from mom and another set from dad. And when sperm and egg meet and produce a single cell zygote, each uh, chromosome, so then we end up with a diploid cell. And I'm sure we, we all learned this from middle school or in high school biology class that this single cell zygote then undergoes multiple rounds of mitosis to make up of tri trillions of cells in our body. And mitosis is the type of cell division that we are all familiar with. So let me briefly go over what happens during mitosis. So in a somatic cell cycle, chromosomes segre uh, duplicate their DNA in S phase, right? And this is called sister chromatids. And then in mitosis, duplicated sister chromatids lined up onto the mitotic spindle. And during mitosis, the sister chromatids segregate, producing two daughter cells with equal number of chromosomes. So in mitosis, chromosome number remains the same. And this, I depicted diploid cell with two, two chromosomes, one, one set of chromosome in blue, another set of chromosome in red. And at the end, end of mitosis, you remain the same set of chromosome. And that's mitosis. But then what is meiosis? Well, meiosis is what completes the cycle of sexual reproduction. And this is the cell division that reduces the chromosome number by half so that we, we create a haploid gamete such as sperm and egg. And this posits a unique problem in terms of uh, cellular cell cycle machinery, because in meiosis, homologous chromosomes segregate. And that way, we, you reduce the chromosome number by half. So at the end of meiosis, you uh, segregate red chromosome apart from one another and blue chromosome apart from one another so that you produce one N haploid gamete instead of two N um, cell. So the main question of my lab is how does meiosis work? How, how does chromosome segregation occur so that you reduce this chromosome number accurately by half? In order to segregate homologous chromosomes during meiosis, chromosomes must undergo very complex series of rearrangement prior to divisions in an extended cell cycle phase called meiotic prophase one. So similar to the somatic cell cycle, meiosis initiates with S phase where DNA is replicated. So in the pre-meiotic S phase, chromosomes are duplicated so that you have a duplicated sister chromatid. But then in meiotic prophase, homologous chromosomes must find each other through an active process called pairing. And in this cartoon diagram, I depicted how chromosomes pair. So red chromosome has to find another red and blue chromosome has to find another blue chromosome and they lined up together. And this pairing process is still mysterious and we actually don't know how they recognize each other. And this pairing is further stabilized by this process called synapsis. And that's de defined by the assembly of protein complex that's shown in green. So I will talk more about this synapsis process, but protein structure assembles between two paired chromosomes and it brings 
chromosomes near to each other and allow the uh, recombination to occur. And while chromosomes undergo pairing and synapses, double strand breaks are induced as part of the meiotic program. And I'm sure you are familiar with how dangerous double strand breaks are during somatic cell cycle. And cells will do their best to repair those breaks. But in meiosis, double strand break formation is part of the meiotic program. And they are programmed to be induced specifically during this early meiotic prophase so that some of the breaks are repaired using homologous chromosome as their repair template and process the breaks into crossover. And crossover recombination holds paired chromosomes together and it physically link to one another so that they can be aligned onto the meiotic spindle. And then in meiosis one, homologous chromosomes segregate and this is the reductional division. And then the cells undergo one more round of cell division, meiosis two. And in meiosis two, just like in mitosis, sisters segregate. So at the end of uh, meiosis, you produce haploid cell from a diploid pre precursor. And I hope you can see that the key events that allow this unique chromosome segregation in meiosis are pairing synapses and crossover recombination between the two homologous chromosome pair. So my lab is interested in these uh, events that occur during meiotic prophase, mainly how these events are uh, or organized and coordinated with meiotic cell cycle stage. And to answer those questions, my lab uses nematode C. elegans, as Kathleen mentioned. And here I'm showing you a, a picture of a worm plate. And this is actually what they look like. You see big worm, this is adult, little ones, there are uh, larval stage worms, and this oval shape stuff, those are the embryos. And C. elegans is a great model organism because it's one of the first metazoan where the whole genome has been sequenced in, and has a great genetics. And it's also transparent. So you can actually see through the cell and people have mapped the entire lineage of the C. elegans development. And it also has a really short life cycle. And here I borrowed a cartoon from Worm Atlas. And you can see that this uh, reproductive adult, which actually happens to be a hermaphrodite, that contains both oocytes and sperm within the same body, so that it can lay a self progeny. Um, and this embryo then go, goes through multiple stages of uh, molting and it has four larval stages. And they develop really quickly. So from a young adult to develop another, the F1 progeny, it only takes about three, four days so that it's really convenient for the scientists to use C. elegans and um, do, do all, all sorts, sorts of research. And we study a uh, meiotic program using C. elegans. And I also have to mention that adult hermaphrodite is small. The length of the animal is only about one millimeter. And what's great about C. elegans is that it's essentially filled with eggs. So here I'm highlighting the germline in red color. And you can see that it's take up a large volume of, of the entire animal. It's taking maybe half the volume. And in the germline, meiosis happens. And at the end of meiosis, you have oocytes. And there is a sperm sac that's that's made pre prior to oocyte development. So that when oocytes pass through the spermatheca, you can have self-fertilized embryos. And what we often do is we dissect the gonad from adult hermaphrodite by cutting either the head or the tail. And in the next slide, I'll show you what the dissected gonad looks like. So here, it's a really simple DNA staining of a dissected gonad. And here, this is the distal tip where 
germline stem cells divide mitotically. And as cells divide, these cells actually push the existing germ cells this way from left to right so that we can see the entire meiotic progression in one animal in a temporal, temporal gradient. So this region of the germline is called pre-meiotic because it's before meiotic entry or mitotic because this is where cells undergo somatic cell cycle. And you can actually see a dividing cell over here. You see two chromosome bodies that are segregating apart from one another. So this is the mitotic zone. But then somewhere here, cells transition into a meiotic fate. And this is a problem of differentiation from a somatic sulfate into a meiotic sulfate. And this region of the gonad is called the transition zone because cells transition from mitosis to meiosis. And this transition zone corresponds to the very beginning of meiotic prophase called the leptotin and zygotin. And this is when chromosomes pair and synapse. And this uh, can be marked better if you were to stain for specific molecular marker. So here I'm showing you the chromosome axis. I will talk more about this structure later on. The axis is shown in red, and this uh, red green staining stands for the synaptonemal complex. And you can see around the transition zone, the green signal comes on to the chromosome and it, it, it loads onto the paired chromosomes. And then over here, you see a complete overlap between green and red, meaning that the synaptonemal complex is complete, the assembly is complete, and that stage is called the packetin. And in packetin, crossover recombination occurs and here I'm showing you the crossover by uh, exchange of the genetic information over here. And in C. elegans, uh, chromosomes remodel after crossover recombination so that the synaptonemal complex begins to disassemble here in this region called the diplotin. And then chromosomes condense further and remodel to form this cruciform shape bivalent and these homologous chromosomes are now connected by, by crossover, and this is called chiasmata when you can visualize uh, by, by simple DNA staining. So at the end of meiotic program, you produce oocytes with uh, paired chromosomes that are connected with one another by crossing over. So this is our experimental setup, and I will show you a lot of images of the dissected C. elegans gonad. Okay, so I hope that you can appreciate that meiotic phages are defined by the synaptonemal complex. And the synaptonemal complex is a hallmark of meiotic chromosome. And this is how we can actually stage distinct stages of meiotic progression. The synaptonemal complex comes in two parts. First, you have to have an axis. And this scaffold of a protein called the chromosome axis is made of cohesins that are specific to meiosis and other meiosis-specific proteins. And this protein scaffold organizes chromatin into loop-like structure. And then later, it serves as a basis for the assembly of the synaptonemal complex. And the synaptonemal complex is a zipper-like structure that assembles between the two chromosome axes. And this has been seen by cytologists for more than 67, 70 years. And here I'm showing you an electron micrograph of the C. elegans synaptonemal complex. This dark structure is chromatin. And you can see a zipper-like structure that holds two paired chromosomes together. And this synaptonemal complex is a highly conserved structure, and it's seen in most eukaryotes. 
And what's striking about this structure is that the overall appearance of the synaptonemal complex is highly conserved, especially with respect to its basic dimensions and organization. The width of the structure is around 100 nanometer, and that feature seems to be conserved across different eukaryotes. However, the protein components that make up the SC have diverged, ex have diverged extensively so that if you just look at the primary amino acid of some of the SC components, the homology is not obvious and you may not be able to find the direct homologs based on the primary amino acid sequence. So what do we know about the SC in C. elegans? Well, over, over the years, genetic screen, for the genetic screen and RNAi screen have identified these four components of the synaptonemal complex in C. elegans. And in fact, they were discovered one by one from these papers. And it's been thought for a long time that these four proteins represent the entire set of the synaptonemal complex proteins. Um, but I was wondering, starting my postdoc, how do they interact with one another and assemble this striking structure that you see universally throughout multiple species? Because we don't know anything about their biochemical interactions. So to get to this question, when I started my lab, we did really simple pull-down experiment. So N2 is our wild type worm strain that doesn't have any transgene. And this strain expresses GAP tag CYP3. And what we did was really simple. We just used GAP handle and pull down proteins associated with CYP3. And as you can see from the silver stain gel, we were able to purify some uh, proteins that are associated with CYP3. So we sent this illusion for mass spec analysis, and we found that as expected, four previously known SC components were found in this illusion. And of course, we found a bunch of other proteins, but these two proteins caught our attention because they were pretty high up on the list and that appear to be specific. And when we looked at the domain structure of the two novel proteins, they contain this coil, coil domain and a disordered region in the C-terminal tail. And it turned out that these two were related. Actually, they have almost 30% sequence identity. And it got us thinking that maybe they could be a novel components of the synaptonemal complex. And as you can see that other SIP proteins also contain the coil coil domain. And in fact, coil coil domain is a common feature shared by all synaptonemal complex proteins, even though the primary amino acid sequence is not very conserved. So from this, uh, purification and the domain structure of the two novel proteins, we suspected that these two proteins might be the new components of the synaptonemal complex. So in order to test it, uh, we tag these two new genes with small epitope. So here we tag one of the genes with HA and visualize its expression in C. elegans. And to our great excitement, we found that the novel protein is going to the synaptonemal complex. And in fact, it co-localizes with the known protein CYP2. And then I want to point out that this one protein expression goes down at the end, and I will come back to this later, what it means. And we tagged the other protein, and we found that this other protein also goes to the synaptonemal complex. So it was really exciting. Um, and we wanted to know where exactly these two proteins go within the structure of the synaptonemal complex. And this, since the width of the structure is only about 100 nanometer, which is below the resolution of the light, conventional light microscopy, we turn to said uh, super resolution microscopy to really point out that the new proteins that we discovered are positioned between the two chromosome axes. 
So we um, imaged HIM3, which is part of the axis relative to our new protein of interest and found that our new protein is positioned between the two chromosome axes, indicating that the protein that we discovered are really going to the synaptonemo complex, not the chromosome axis. So it was really exciting and it um, allowed us to name these two new genes. So we named one of them CYP5 and other CYP6. So now we have six CYP proteins in C. elegans. Okay, so, but we wanted to take this further and we wanted to see exactly where the CYP5 and CYP6 proteins localize within the synaptonemal complex protein. And we turned to my friend Simona Kohler at EMBL Heidelberg because she has previously mapped all the individual components within this structure using STORM and POM, or single molecule localization microscopy. And she has produced this model previously pointing where the individual components are localized within this 100 nanometer width structure. So we turned to her and asked her to image CYP5 and CYP6. And in order to orient these two new proteins, we created these two strains with N-terminal tag, um, N-terminal end tag with HA and C-terminal end tag with HA. And we map where the HA is localized within the structure. And she uh, found that the N-terminal tag HA is localized between the two chromosome axes similar to what we show with STED. And you can see that also the Z-plane, this is the cross section, and Z-plane is pretty tight. But surprisingly, when she visualized C-terminal end of the protein, now we see two separate lines within the two chromosome axes. And again, the Z-plane is really tight. And together, we were able to conclude that CYP5 and CYP6 are actually transversing the width of the synaptonemal complex with N-terminal facing head to head in the middle and C-terminal end facing toward the chromosome axis. And in fact, this type of head to head orientation of the transverse element of the synaptonemal complex is conserved throughout eukaryotes. And it allows us to conclude that the new proteins are transversing the width of the symptonemo complex. And it's actually cool because C. elegans is probably unique in that it has multiple transverse element proteins within the symptonemo complex. So then you wonder, we wondered why we have two proteins, CYP5 and CYP6, that are related. What is the evolutionary origin of the two proteins? So we looked at synteny, where the gene is located relative to one another in neighboring genes. And when we looked at the location of CYP5 in several nematode species, we were able to find that CYP5 is the synteny, the exact order of the gene is conserved, meaning that CYP5 is probably derived from an ancestral gene. CYP6, on the other hand, seems to be unique in C. elegans. And based on the phylogenetic analysis, we find that C. elegans, which happens to be the model organism in scientific community, has uniquely duplicated CYP5 so that it has both CYP5 and CYP6. OK, so then what are the mutant phenotypes? Why? What, what do they do in terms of meiotic uh, progression? So we created null alleles for a single and a double using CRISPR and examined the structure of the synaptonemal complex. Here I'm showing you the wild type staining. Um, HCP3 is part of the axis and CYP2 is in the middle. And in wild type, you will see com complete overlap between HCP3 and CYP2. And when we looked at the single mutant, 
CYP6 is completely fine. It, it forms the Santonimo complex just fine. And CYP6 single has some problem, but overall CYP2 can load even though the signal appears faint. It can form some stretches of the Septonimo complex. But when we deleted both, now we see complete loss of the structure, indicating that both of these proteins play redundant roles in assembly of the Sneptonimo complex. I, get, I can see the question from the comment. And one of the question was whether the C-terminal N has function. And I will show you at the end. OK. And we, in addition to the structure of the SC, we can easily assay whether crossover formation happens or not based on the simple DNA staining of the oocytes. So in C. elegans, there are six chromosomes. So at the end of meiosis within individual oocyte, you see six DAPI staining bodies, which represent six pairs of chromosomes that are held together by chiasmata. But if crossover formation fails, then these chromosomes are no longer connected to one another. So you see 12 univalent and you see 12 DAPI staining bodies. So based on this simple DNA staining, we can assess whether crossovers happened or not. So we looked at these in our mutants. And as you would expect from the synapsis phenotype, we found that um, CYP6 mutant doesn't have any problem, can form crossover just fine, because we can count the number of chromosomes as six. Right, but in CYP5 single mutant, the number increased up to about seven from six. But when we deleted both genes, now we see a complete failure in crossover formation and see 12 univalent instead of six bivalent. And why is CYP5 more important? And we wondered whether it's due to maybe the expression level of CYP6 relative to CYP5. So in order to test that, we blotted for the protein level by Western blot using the identical epitope HA. And as you can see from this Western blot, it turns out that CYP6 expression is a lot lower than CYP5. And we attributed to a less important role of CYP6 to this reduced protein level. And I also want to remind that CYP6 is the one that abruptly drops the expression in lay packaging. And we think that they, it also contributes to this uh, less important function of the CYP6. And these may explain the great, greater functional contribution by CYP5. Let me uh, answer questions on the comment. Bea Beatrice asks uh, if the structural mapping of the protein help you further elucidate its function. Had your prior studies already done so effective, effectively? Protein structural mapping of the protein? That, yeah, that would be the case. We don't have the structure, and it would be hard to determine the structure through conventional like crystallization because these proteins have disordered region but we would like to map protein-protein interaction uh, region of the SIPs, how they come together and assemble this structure. Um, and then Chris Christian asked, to what extent do you believe these results can be extrapolated to other animals and drug discovery or what possible applications can this discovery bring? That's a good question and a tough question. It, since these proteins are not conserved, at least in terms of primary amino acid sequence, I don't know how this discovery can be related to other eukaryotes, but some themes are definitely conserved. The fact that these are the elongated coil, coil domain protein, the fact that they are oriented in head-to-head -head manner, and Maybe their biophysical property, how they assemble, it might be conserved across species, but we don't know yet. Yeah. Okay, 
So I want to talk more about the role of the synaptonemal complex in regulating crossover, because crossover is what enables homologous chromosomes to segregate. And crossover formation also uh, defines the genetic exchange, right, between maternal and paternal chromosome, and has a long-term consequence in terms of genetic diversity and evolution of sexually reproducing organism. And in fact, crossover is tightly regulated in most animals, and that ex uh, regulation is extreme in C. elegans, such that you only have one crossover per chromosome. And we can mark the site of crossover using this cytological marker called COSA1. So this protein COSA1 appears as distinct puncta. And in fact, you will see six foci of COSA1 per nucleus in late packetin. And based on this localization pattern, we can visualize the site of crossover designation in C. elegans. So we looked at COSA1 localization in our SIP mutants. And in wild type, as I show you in the previous slide, there are six COSA1 foci per nucleus. And when we counted COSA1 foci in our single mutants, we found that in SIP5 mutant, where there are some minor SC defects, we see something like four to seven or even eight COSA1. And I told you that in C. elegans, crossover control is very tight so that it's always six in wild type. But we see sometimes greater than six COSA1 foci in single SIP5 mutant, which indicates that SIP, at the synaptonemal complex has some role in limiting the number of crossovers across across the chromosome length. And in fact, that's consistent with what we previously known about the role of the synaptonemal complex. And in SIP6 single, there's no change, which is consistent with the idea that this mutant doesn't show any meiotic phenotype. And when we looked at um, the SIP5 and SIP6 double mutant, we already know that there are no crossovers right, because there's 12 univalents, and yet we could see there are still COSA1 foci appearing within each nucleus, which indicates that without the synaptonemal complex, these recombination sites cannot mature into real crossover. So these this results indicate the complex role of the synaptonemal complex in both promoting and also limiting the number of crossovers in meiosis. So let me answer some of the questions in the comment. Is there any evolution, uh, evolutive advantage on C. elegans because only this species has the protein SIP6? The presence of these proteins help the formation of the symptonimbo complex? That's a good question. We actually speculated in our paper. I think what's known in, in the evolutionary field, typically gene duplication helps a robust, helps this process to be robust so that even if you lose one, the other is present so that it can support the synaptonemal complex formation. So we think that the gene duplication allows this process to be robust. And in a way this, uh, this is the reason why people haven't discovered these new genes, because if you have a single mutant, the phenotypes are not obvious. And we were lucky because we could find these through biochemical purification. And I think C. elegans is unique, but it happens to be the most popular model organism in nematode. So I think there is um, some story behind. And then, Another question that I see is, I would like to know if you think about making knockout animal for these proteins and see if they can be replaced by other proteins and which are the effect. Other proteins, meaning proteins from other species. We haven't thought about it and we haven't done it. <laughs> but it would be interesting to try. Okay, so then 
come to the C terminal end. I think Kotlin asked about this. So I mentioned in the beginning that these proteins have low complexity region in the C terminal end. And they happen to be very conserved and happen to contain exceedingly acidic residues. And as you can see from this protein sequence alignment, this C terminal end of the proteins are enriched in Ds and Es, and they actually appear in chunks. So we were curious what they do, and we decided to answer this by creating a series of truncation mutants of both CYP5 and CYP6. So what's the functional significance of the tail in SC assembly and crossover formation? And what we found is that even in our truncation mutant, deleting just two residues at the end show SC defects. So as you can see, compared to the wild type, you see a less green signal in, in the C. elegans gonad. And these defects are worse progressively as we chop off more C-terminal end of the protein. And what's really interesting to us is that the crossover control is also messed up. So here I'm showing you CYP2, which is the CYP at synaptonemal complex and COSA1 marking individual crossover site and wild type UC6 COSA1 foci. But in our largest truncation of, and, and our truncation series, the number of COSA1 foci is reduced less than six. So you see three, two, four, or six COSA1 foci indicating that the SC, the intact synaptonemal complex is important for making crossovers. But when we look at the largest truncation mutant, the number is reduced, but sometimes we see double COSA1 foci per stretch. So here I highlighted that with arrows. So you can see sometimes you see two COSA1 foci per a single SC stretch, indicating that this chromosome-wide crossover control to limit the number of crossover per to one per chromosome is now weakened so that you sometimes see two COSA1 foci per chromosome stretch. And we wanted to look at this further, and we utilize this uh, chromosome fusion that's been around for, for a while in C. elegans community. So this chromosome fusion is between chromosome X and chromosome 4. And be because these two chromosomes are fused to one another, it's, it's twice the length of regular chromosome, right? So that the crossover control, even in wild type, is weakened. So that even in wild type, you see one or two crossovers per this fusion chromosome. And we can mark this fusion chromosome using this protein called HIM8, which specifically binds to one end of chromosome X. And we simply counted the number of COSA1 foci. And if, if we see six, oh, so if we see five, we assume, we assume that um, there's one crossover per this fusion chromosome. And if we see five, then, sorry, if we see six, then we assume that there are two COSA1 foci per this fusion chromosome. And when we see two COSA1 foci, they tend to be far apart from one another. So here is the distribution of the COSA1 foci. And when we see two COSA1, they tend to be made far apart from one another. And that's consistent with the phenomenon known as crossover interference. However, when we looked at our truncation mutants, we see increased number of COSA1 foci. So here we see two, three, or four COSA1 foci per this fusion chromosome, and their distribution seem to be more random. So they are more evenly distributed, indicating that the tail of C5 and C6 contributes to this chromosome-wide crossover control so that they are made far apart from one another. And we can see whether this actually resulted into chiasma 
chiasma formation. And we can assay this, the shape of the chromosome in all sites. So here I'm showing you two examples of wild type chromosomes where there is a single chias chiasma or two chiasmata. And this can be marked by this green staining. But in our truncation mutants, the number of chiasmata seem to be greatly increased. So we mostly see double chiasmata or more than three. We uh, gave up counting because it's maybe more than four. <laughs> and we just classify them as three plus. But it's clear that without the C-terminal tail, we see increased number of chiasmata, which indicates that the tail is critical for the crossover number control so that it can limit crossover to one per chromosome. OK, so to summarize what I told you so far today, we discovered two new proteins that are part of the Sneptonemo complex. And CYP5 and CYP6 happen to be related. They are par paralogs. And it had, that's why they have, been, uh, have not been discovered through conventional genetic screen. And using genetic redundancy and structure function analysis, we show and actually uh, reinforce the idea that the Sneptonemo complex is important for crossover control in C. elegans meiosis. So that's what I prepared for today. And this was my lab last year. The lab has changed um, since then. But this work was by my grad student, Matt Herlock. And we had several collaborators for this work. The super resolution, especially the storm imaging, was done by uh, Simona Kohler and Jonas Ries at EMBL Heidelberg. We did stat imaging at Carnegie together with Joe Gogol. And some of the evolutionary study was done by Lisa Kersall and Ofer Rogue at the University of Utah. And thank you for your attention. And I'll be happy to take questions. And I know there are questions in the comment. And let me address that. OK, so Tiago asked, are the CYP5 and CYP6 mutants fertile? They are not. The eggs are dead. So without successful meiosis, worms will lay eggs, but all, most of the eggs are dead because they inherit incorrect number of chromosomes. Yeah, so that's the consequence of meiotic failure. Yeah, I think you have already responded some questions, right? You mean? Yeah, it's, it's really cool for the students to see how with a simple organism, right, it's, it's possible to learn a lot and even discover new proteins. Yeah, right? I'm so surprised because the elegance meiosis has been studied quite extensively, right? And mm -hmm. Sinalegans is the genetic model organism. And you think that the genes have, all the genes have been discovered. But I was surprised that there are still new genes without names. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I think they, they say mo most of the genome actually is still unknown protein. Right. The genes have been annotated. So people knew that there are these are the genes, mm -hmm. but they have not been characterized. Yeah. <laughs> and I also see how important it is because you have to add some genetics, biochemistry, and molecular biology, right? Of cloning the constructs. And I think this is very important for the students in their own projects that they think that they can combine methods, but sometimes actually think simple on a way that we pay a lot of attention on what we are seeing, right? Because here funding is not so abundant and often we do very sophisticated methodologies that don't respond much. Yeah. I think this is an example of how 
with uh, less sophisticated yeah. in, in yeah. one sense. Simple worm. Yeah, <laughs> obviously you need very good microscopes, right? And access to facilities. And if you want to do structural work here, we have um, also structural biology and cryo I am. Oh, cool. uh, I am working now. <laughs> And, and a new synchrotron that will soon offer the services for, for the yeah. users. So. Yeah, I see some questions in comments. Carlos asks, have you tried to find C proteins in other reptiles? We could find them through sequence on a, like genome search. Yeah, you could find them through a homology search. And what are the next steps in your research? <laughs> Good questions. So from the related to this, yeah, we would like to know how SIP proteins interact with one another and how synaptonemo complex assembly is regulated. And we actually focus a lot on kinases, how phosphorylation regulates this, these processes. And just like in other cell cycle events, majority of the Meiotic events are also controlled by kinases, cell cycle kinases and phosphatases. So that's one major topic of our research. And we are currently following up on some proteins that we discovered in CYP3IP. So I talked about CYP5 and CYP6, but there were other proteins that we discovered and we are currently following up on some other proteins. Yeah. Any other question? Thank so you. Many, <laughs> and many people are saying they really liked to see the talk, right, Yumi? Because it's a very cool, hot topic. Yeah, so let me ask one more, one more question. Mm -hmm. What is your hypothesis for how cells limit the number of crossing over, how chromosomes know that a crossover happen to avoid? Yeah, that's an excellent question. There are competing hypotheses, and it's actually been a long question, long-standing question in the field. And yeah, we don't know for sure. One idea involves mechanical force that chromosome made are under some kind of constraint, mechanical constraint. Another school argues for a biochemical signaling. So yeah, that's a really important question in the field. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And I would like to thank you, Yumi, for giving us the opportunity to yeah. thank know you about for our inviting knowledge. Me. I and wish we were in person. <laughs> do you want to just say a few words about your lab, right? Because here there are many grad students and talk a little bit maybe about your department and how people come to your lab yeah so my lab is in the biology department at johns hopkins university johns hopkins is well known for its medical school and but our lab is in the university side where undergrad students are he there are so we are not in medical school we are in school of arts and sciences and my lab is relatively small. I work mostly with grad students. I currently have five grad students, but two of them will be graduating this summer. And then I have one technician and five undergrad students. But undergrad students, they come and go. <laughs> and um, yeah, so that's my lab. I work with mostly young students. And do you have interest in accepting postdocs? Because yeah. Because now there is new fellowships from Brazil to go abroad. You know, they were kind of frozen, but now they are appearing again. Some of the calls. yeah, I love to have work. I would like to work with postdocs, but so far it's been difficult to recruit postdocs, and I think it's partly because of my uh, lack of reputation <laughs> or or maybe the city it didn't have 
it doesn't have great reputation. <laughs> yes, well, I think it's, this is why it's important to give the talks and then yeah. students get to know and they can plan ahead. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay, then thank you, Yumi. I will end the broadcast now. Okay, thank you. And if all. there is any other questions from the students, because we have a Google Classroom, then I will pass them to you. Okay, okay sounds good. Bye.